We're going to move into the book of Deuteronomy tonight, which is uh, in Joshua. Deuteronomy and Joshua, we're going to go out of the books of Moses and into the books of history. Uh, and uh, this is class number five, as indicated on the thing there. Class number five. So that means that we have, uh, what, after this, nine classes left, I think, 14 classes total. So. Are we going to go where? Caroling. Oh, did we? Did we do that as part of my class? Oh, I think we did that. I think we did that on exam night. Yeah. Well, maybe we will do that. That's right. Okay. Go caroling on 34th Street for the final exam. Okay. So, wow, that's like such an idea. Who would... <laughs> We have a chorus of 34, and everyone gets an A by singing an A. <laughs> hey, hey, it's not even Halloween yet, please. It's only October 1st. It's like, wow. That's all right. Okay. All right, let's pray. And, uh, oh, should we sing? Everyone don't, yeah, <laughs> sing a Christmas carol. Oh, John, you want to lead a Christmas carol? Uh <clears throat> Let's see, I'm trying to think. What old song haven't I done? Of course, Matt Roberts did a couple of old ones last night. That's, uh, <clears throat> okay, stand up, stand up, we'll sing. Uh, <clears throat> oh, how about this one? This is a good one. Uh, you remember this one? Some will remember this one. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, sets the captives free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up, oh well, within my soul. Spring up, oh well, within me whole. Spring up, oh well, and give to me that life abundantly. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, sets the captives free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up, oh well. Then my soul, spring up, oh well. And make me whole, spring up, oh well. And make me me that life abundantly. All right. Okay. Lord, we thank you for your grace, your joy, and uh, for old songs that apparently only last 72 seconds. Uh, but that's okay. Better than seven minutes and 20 seconds. And <laughs> sometimes. In Jesus' name, we ask you to bless this class to our hearts and minds. Amen. All right, so <clears throat> tonight we are in book five, <clears throat> class five, book five of Moses. So this is uh, Deuteronomy. That's where we are. We're in the book of Deuteronomy tonight. So this is uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and now Moses is going to be saying goodbye to the people that he spent uh, 40 years in the desert with. And so, you know, there was a couple of times during the course of those 40 years when Moses wished he could say goodbye. God gave him the option of, you know, having everyone go away and starting all over with his family, and Moses didn't take that option. So he spent 40 years in the wilderness with his people. So this is a series, really this is a series of farewell speeches uh, that Moses gives to the people of Israel, and then a song. His last couple chapters are a long song, so probably more than seven minutes and 20 seconds long, I think it took him to, if he sang it, I'm kind of interested in how 120-year-old Moses sang his song, but it is referred to as a song in the, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy. So it means second law, that, you know, that first, that prefix there, that means second law, uh, D-U, 
D-E-U-T, so, and uh, it's a preparation for the people. The people have been in the wilderness for 40 years. They've come out of Israel. They didn't have to be there for that long, uh, but their disobedience put them there uh, in the wilderness for that long, and now uh, they're about to cross over the river and into their promised land, and, um, and they're gonna conquer that. They're gonna possess the land, so this is the high point of their travel or the end point of their travel and they're going to settle into their territory finally. Um, so every one of Moses's books has a role uh, and it tells us something and um, the first book tells about God's sovereignty and his over uh, his rulership in the plan for Israel. So we know that in Genesis, you started with one man, one woman, and then it, you know, it exploded to a certain point. An evil, evil uh, generation had developed, evil world had developed, and God started all over with Noah, and then he called Abraham, and then from Abraham, you know, he uh, called out this group of people, Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob, and Jacob's 12 sons formed the 12 tribes of Israel. So Exodus was God's love in the redemption, his charity in the redemption. Leviticus showed the separation or the sanctity of the person of God as he was related. Be ye holy as I am holy. That's what he's trying to communicate to his people. And then the severity, numbers is a severity in the providence of God. Like there are, there is a certain, throughout the book of Numbers we noticed that there was a challenge. There was a challenge to, <laughs> There was a challenge uh, to the people, or the people would complain, they were murmuring, and something, the consequences of their disobedience. And there, so the providence of God, the, the, uh, the disobedience uh, would bring uh, severity in there. And then we'll see some more severity as we get into the book of Joshua. And then this one is the solemn, or the seriousness of the principles of God. It's like these things are serious, uh, solemn, is. A, the solemnity of it all, or the seriousness of the principles of God. And that's what, uh, you know, Moses is very serious in these final days. He's concerned. I've carried you in my heart, and I've helped you across this wilderness. I've watched you be stiff-necked. I've watched you be stubborn. I have prayed for you. I have interceded for you. I have gone up to the mountain to bring down the words of God to you. And uh, Moses is concerned. I mean, he's, he's concerned about what Israel will become after he leaves. He understands that this people is not an easy people to be with, and he's recognizing something. So there's a seriousness about this book. I'm telling you again. I'm telling you again. And of course we know that during the 40 years in the wilderness, because they had disobeyed God when they could have gone right into the land and had the milk and honey, and had the giant grapes and all the cities there right away. If they had gone in, um, you know, there wouldn't have been so much death. But we know that 600,000 men died in 40 years. That's a lot of burials, a lot of death. 600,000 fighting men would die. Yeah. Because when they numbered at the beginning of numbers, you have, uh, at the beginning of numbers, you have a census and there's 600 and 3,000 fighting men, and then at the end of Numbers, you have another census, and there's 601,000 fighting men. Fighting men are between the ages of 20 and 50. So uh, they sent 12 spies into the land. Uh, only Moses and uh, only Jake, um, only Joshua and Caleb brought back a good report saying, let's go in and take it. So out of all the 600,000 and some men, only two uh, went in. So. 600,000 fighting men uh, died in the wilderness there. So, and, so, and God said, this is gonna be your punishment for uh, not, you know, this is gonna be the consequence for you not believing me about the land. So, um, that's what, you know, that's what, that's what happened. And so now we're at the verge of going in. So Deuteronomy provides a, a, a review, really, of the nation's history to this point and then there's a renewal of the covenant uh, between God and the fathers of the nation concerning the promised land. So uh, you have this 
Uh, this is his historical purpose. And so Moses is going to tell them just where they came from, uh, how much stupidity they were involved in. You read through Deuteronomy, you see Moses telling them again and again just how many times, you know, how many times did you just you know, murmur against God, challenge my authority. And then at the end, there, you know, there's going to be a, a, a ceremony of circumcision for all the the boys that had been born during that time, there hadn't been any circumcision. It's going to be a reestablishment of the covenant between uh, that God instituted with Abraham. So that's going to be a part of it. So there's going to be a renewal of this. And this is all the preparation for a new phase of life. You're going to go into the promised land. The man is going to stop falling. You're going to have to start um, raising your uh, own crops and feeding yourself. That's going to have to happen. Yeah. No. So that's going to happen. And so on this side of the Jordan, they're going to be on one side of the river, and then they're going to cross over a river. They've gone through a sea that, you know, that opened for them, and now a river is going to open for them again, and they're going to cross over and be into their promised land. And this is the last, you know, this is the last exchange, the last communication that Moses is going to give them about these things. Uh, there's a doctrinal purpose. And uh, there's a, the idea of blessing and cursing and life and death. The idea of choosing life and choosing blessing over the curse. Choose life, blessing. Choose curse, uh, choose death and the cursing. It's, you know, it's put there. The people of Israel had told Moses when they, and told Moses and God, in essence, uh, that all that the Lord has said we will do. They had said that to the Lord. God's given us this uh, instruction, and so uh, you know, we're going to be faithful. They, they committed themselves. They made a vow. They made an oath. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We can do this. And they didn't realize their own capacities, their limited capacities. Uh, so, so the doctrinal purpose, it says, you know, God's instructions on how to live a victorious life. There's going to be a lot of things that Moses is going to tell these people uh, about what's coming for them. And, um, you know, how, how will we survive this prosperity, okay? You've gone from slavery, and that wasn't, you know, that was 430 years, that wasn't such a, a great deal for you, because you cried out for it. And now you've been in the wilderness, and you've seen God do things, but you haven't really believed who He is and how much He is for you. You've watched Him lead you in a pillar of cloud, You've watched him lead you with a pillar of fire. You've watched him open a sea, swallow your enemies. This is all that you've, all that you've seen, people of Israel. Uh, and now you're going into a place of blessing. Now you're going to be in that place of blessing. But uh, something has to be, there's some instruction, there's some things that I need to tell you about how to live with this kind of blessing. The, the adversity tests, the slavery tests resulted in you becoming one way. Uh, the wandering tests, those kind of, that kind of life, resulted in you being uh, a murmuring, complaining group of people. Even as you watched all these people die, you would think that maybe you'd be prepared for rest and prosperity. And the answer to that as we read through the Bible is they are for a season, but we see the uh, limited capacity of human beings to be faithful to anything, even when they've seen amazing things done by the God of creation in front of them. So. Uh, so doctrinal purpose, God gives you instructions, and when God gives those instructions, He intends for you to use them and to apply them. You know, it's a structure that He's giving you. Obedience to God's law is necessary for your blessing and your well-being. So it's necessary. I mean, these these things are aren't there just aren't out there just to uh, um, what is it? Just as like uh, philosophy. It's like what God is saying is like speaking to the human condition. Like the, the, all of Deuteronomy, you find answers probably for any kind of psychosis or neurosis that might be living in somebody. And then you say that's kind of simplistic, but it really goes through talking about the things that you get entangled with and how Israel as a nation is really uh, maybe symbolic of me as a person, like as a human being. Uh, Israel is sort of representing just how um, foolish I can be, just how distracted I can get, just how weak I can be, and just how, uh, how given to passion or lust 
that can happen very quickly, even when I've seen all of the things that I've seen. And that's, you know, that may, might be one of the things. Seeing doesn't necessarily help people believe so much, you know. And, it, you know, that's a, a constant kind of thread through the Bible. Amazing things happen. Israel sees it. Uh, they enjoy it. They rejoice in it. And then after the hangover is over, there's the party and then there's the hangover. There's sort of like, you know, wow, this is really nice. That was really nice, you know. And then it's like they get away from that and they become distracted in other things. All right, now the Christ-centered purpose of this is that there is the promise here that at a certain time there will be another person like me. Moses is saying to them, um, there's going to be another person speaking like I'm speaking. There's going to be another person that shines the way that I shine in terms of, uh, uh, of um, the glory of God upon them. That person is going to come from you. Uh, it's going to come out of your nation. There's going to be another prophet speaking for the nation of Israel. And um, the book is written to say, be looking for him. You know, be looking for this next one that's coming. Uh, it's reconfirmed in Acts 7.37 in the speech of Stephen. Stephen, when, before he's stoned, he's speaking to the people. You are stiff-necked people because everyone since Israel came out of Egypt, Israel has always been uh, dull and hard of uh, hearing. And uh, even though they saw, they haven't really believed that God is for them. And there's going to be another one that comes. So Deuteronomy is the most quoted book in the New Testament. That makes sense. That makes sense because um, uh, Deuteronomy was the compact, the compact form of all that Moses taught. Moses taught Genesis, the origins of everything, all of the histories, the family lineage, the ancestry. He taught all of that and he wrote it all down in Genesis for them. Exodus is a, is a, is a part is a part the story of the coming out, the history, and then also the instructions as it relates to the commandments and then the instructions regarding the tabernacle. And then we get total instruction on how to live and how to worship in Leviticus. But all of this is like Deuteronomy is like the, uh, what would you call it? What's the, what do they call those little books? Cliff notes? They used to call them cliff notes. What do they call them now? Spark notes? You know, you take a massive book like and you, you know, you put it all down. They used to call it cliff notes, you know. Don't read all of Hamlet, just read the cliff notes that tell you all the, you know. And if you had a smart teacher and she realized that you were reading cliff notes, there was something in there that totally threw you off, you know. This is not in cliff notes. Anyway, but this is the, this is the, this is the second telling of the law, and it is, it's, it's just, it's a firm telling of the law, and it's a straight telling of the law. And so this is the most quoted book in the New Testament, cited more than 80 times. And it's the essence when Jesus is in the wilderness with um, uh, the devil tempting him. It is written, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy, it is written, men shall not live by bread alone. These kinds of things. It is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. It is written, him alone shall you worship. And that's, you know, that's the essence of Jesus' battle is his understanding of, of course, he understands Deuteronomy. <laughs> Why wouldn't Jesus understand Deuteronomy? You know, he is Deuteronomy. You know, he's the walking, walking word, the living word. So, and these, this is the, these are the scriptures that Jesus uses as a man to combat the, um, the uh, what is it, the temptations of the devil, the error, the way that the devil tries to use words against men and to confuse them. So I don't, I don't want to diminish like this, uh, uh, it's, it's very, I, I would never diminish like, you know, we say, well, that was Jesus. That was Jesus. That was Jesus. Like, I mean, I, you know, how, you know, he, you know, look, look, he spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness not eating. That was Jesus. And that really doesn't apply to me. I don't want you to, I think it's very important that we not ever think of Jesus and his humanity as being something, at, um, you know, something, um, what is it? Uh, something comic book like or uh, superhero like Jesus was a real man and he was you know when the devil said you know turn the stone into bread he was really hungry and uh, when the devil tried to tempt him into doing these other things he listened to the devil he could hear the devil he could understand what he was saying 
he could feel and sense the kind of emotion that we have. It's just that he did not give himself over to that. So, you know, the miracle of Jesus is 30 some years of a constant right decision so that when he goes to the cross, there is no spot in him. There is no, any, there, there is no spot in him. There's nothing so much so that the Romans had to take the cross off of him. That's, you know, maybe that's a little, uh, if you study some of the history, the historical background of what that meant for that, for the um, malefactor to carry his cross up the hill, it was a declaration of guilt. It was an admission of uh, guilt. And if Jesus, you know, had carried that, he would have been, uh, he didn't lie to Pilate and say that he was something he was not. He didn't lie to anybody. And him carrying the cross up the hill uh, could have been, and it could have been seen in the historical concept, see, you know, he's guilty, but he wasn't. But the man carrying it up the hill for him was definitely a sinner. Jesus was not. So all of these things work together, and Jesus lived by the Word of God the way we have to live by the Word of God. So, make sense? You all right? You okay? It's all right? Did you know that the Orioles are in the playoffs? Okay. <laughs> So that's why I'm in orange and black tonight. It's just, so that's why there's no homework this week. That and the celebration of my birthday yesterday. So just telling you that. Those online, the Orioles are a baseball team if you're in Europe. Baseball is kind of a semi-slow game that we watch during the summer. Not at all like football, you know. Not at all like, you know, football or your kind of football. If you're, whatever. Anyway, here we go. All right, so we have some uh, lessons, I think, that we can learn from Moses. I think we can learn some lessons from Moses. And, and one is like you wave a stick at the water and the water goes, no, that's not a lesson that we learn from Moses. What are some lessons that we learn from Moses? Just think about it. So why don't you uh, talk to somebody near you for a couple minutes and uh, figure out, well, I get some water because I think I'm losing my voice slowly but surely. Uh, and... Um, and then uh, we'll just think about some things that you might have learned from Moses. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay, anyone wanna? All right, what are some things that we, what are some things that we learned from Moses, like personal? Yes, Lynn, pardon? Obedience, obedience. Yes, Daniel. Yes. I see. Yeah. Enjoy the time in the presence of God. Listen to God. Let Him write things for you. Enjoy that. Yeah. That would be something. Anyone else? One more? What's that? Meekness. Yeah, it does say that Moses became the meekest man on the earth at a certain point. Like there was something. Yes. Eternal security. Okay. I, I, I agree with that. I, I mean, yeah, because we see that Moses, you're going to find out that, you know, that God is severe, most severe with his leaders. You're going to think about, but God is still with him all the way through. God is secure. And he says that. That's one of the things that Moses communicates to um, Joshua, that God is always with you and never leaves you nor forsakes you. Okay, so, all right, so here's, one, here's something. God had a hand on him, so we know that that's from the story. When we think about the story of Moses, we think of that first part of it, okay? Pharaoh decrees that the, the Israelite people are multiplying so much, and he says, every male child must go into the river. And again, there's a background here. Pharaoh is also trying to sacrifice something to the, the god of the river. So uh, Pharaoh is thinking of, he's, he's, he's doing two things at once. Two things at once. I can get rid of some male children in Israel, and I can also have some sacrifices going to the god of the Nile. Now remember this polytheism, this kind of idea. Gods have very human, every kind of concept in polytheism is that God, that the gods are jealous and that they are like humans, and you have to stroke their ego, and you have to do something to make them do good things for you. You have to do good things for the gods so that they will do good things for you. 
And that's the, that's the uh, you know, that was one of the things that Pharaoh was saying. It's like, we're going we're gonna to get rid of a bunch of Israelites, and we are also going to appease the God of the river. What could be so wrong about that, you know? And here we see this, this little, the, you know, who knows how old she is. She has, this is her third child. She has a son, she has a daughter, and this is a, her youngest son, and she puts him in the river. And so she obeys the letter of the command, like, put your son in the river. You didn't say I couldn't put him in the river in a, you know, in a, you know, a sealed, a, you know, perfectly sealed um, basket, and it went down the river, and, and we don't know, you know, how, but it wound up in the, uh, it wound up somewhere where Pharaoh's daughter was taking a bath. And Pharaoh's daughter apparently wanted to be, you know, a mother. And we don't know the whole context of that, but she took Moses in and became his mother, and he became part of that. Uh, Moses was impulsive. That comes back to the uh, eternal security thing that uh, Calvin mentioned, is that there was a call on Moses' life. The order of God, the plan of God did not uh, veer from that, but Moses did something. Uh, there you see Moses looking to the left, uh, getting ready to strike down that uh, slave master as, you know, Moses understood who he was. Now, you know the story about Moses, right? Like Moses, uh, Moses, uh, when the Pharaoh's daughter found Moses, he was sent to his own mother to be nursed until he was, uh, you know, until he was done breastfeeding. After he was weaned, he was brought to Pharaoh. So we don't know how long that had, how long he spent in his, um, in his mom's home, but he was in his home and, you know, who knows what followed him into the, uh, um, into the uh, Pharaoh's uh, palace with him. But, you know, these memories, but he saw, he, he saw this as a way, he's, at some point Moses came to understand who he was, and he saw this as an attack on his brothers. And so he killed somebody, buried him in the sand, and we know that from there he went sent into the wilderness. And uh, the grand, you know, out in the wilderness, what does Moses learn? I don't, I, I'm not quite sure, but in his heart, he's encountering things that he didn't encounter in Egypt. Egypt is a contrived civilization. You got pyramids. They're ma man-made mountains, but out in the wilderness, Moses is seeing other things. He's seeing, like, the amazing creation of God. He's meeting, uh, you know, a group of people, and one of those people will become his wife. And then he's in the wilderness and he sees a bush that's burning and he's on fire. He has to see it. He has to go and find it from there. Uh, he has to go see what there. So he learns in the, in the wilderness maybe is where Moses became the most acquainted and the quietness of that. The noise of Egypt with all of its celebrations and its gods and all of its uh, prosperity. What was that doing to Moses? We don't know, you know. Egypt is always in the Bible a, a uh, a great representation of our, our system, our world system. And uh, God is taking Moses out of it first and showing him something and about, and I think it's right what Daniel said, there is a relationship that Moses developed. And then when the, when the uh, you know, he was aware, he was aware enough to see a burning bush and, uh, and uh, curious enough to draw near to it and obedient enough to take his shoes off when the bush talked to him, when God talked to him out of the bush. So the majesty of God out in that place, in the quiet place where he was away from. And it's an important thing, like maybe it's not such a, you know, when we hear people talk about solitude and being quiet and being in a place where we can listen and turning off the noise and everything, it's like that's for monks. You know, that's not for like, that's for like Buddhist monks or other people who are really just trying to detach themselves from the world and uh, just trying to get away from it all. And, but out in the wilderness, 40 years, 40 years out there, Moses learned something, some sense of awareness of who God was, and it, and it worked something into his life. Uh, so when God revealed himself, I am that I am, Yahweh the God who is. Now imagine this, like if you're in the... Uh, you're in the city, you know how everything goes, you know like the time frame and everything. It's like you're on Pharaoh's time, 
you're on Egypt time. It's like this is this day and this is a celebration of this God and this is the celebration of this and, and Pharaoh's daughter's getting married. There's going to be a big thing. He's got a big calendar. He's got all that. But when he's out there in the wilderness, it's just like, who knows? The sun comes up, the sun goes down. What month is it anyway? Am I 52? Am I 78? Am I 36? What am I? I'm not quite sure. And uh, that's the, th I think, you know, when he's totally like outside of all of this, then God introduces himself. And it's important, I think, Moses' time in the wilderness, away from all of that kind of thing, away from all of the information, because when God introduces himself, here's a concept that's going to be hard, that's still difficult for human beings to understand that God is. And introducing him, I am that I am. It's like, that's what you're going to tell him, I am. Uh, that's all, and Jesus uses this term also. Before Abraham was, I am. It's like, that's a grammatical structure that we would say, Jesus, you should brush up on your English skills. Because he's talking in the past tense, and then he comes in with a present tense understanding, I am. Before Abraham was, I is. You know, if you want to say it, I is. You know, somebody, that would maybe make it more. But Jesus is saying that in essence, because God is. God is. He uh, eternally is. He's outside of time. Time is for us. The uh, orbits of the planets are set in motion by God, and that's how we measure time. But it's... Uh, you know, we have, we have crafted these measurements, but God hasn't crafted them for himself. And so a thousand years is like a day to the Lord, and a day is like a thousand years, it says in the Psalms. So Moses is there. Moses can uh, meet God on this way, understand who God is, listen to him. And, uh, you know, if he's still in the city, he's still in this place, then maybe he doesn't see that so much. Maybe he's not aware of that. So uh, there's a lesson there. I'm, you know, God brought Moses to the wilderness because he was, you know, there was something Moses had to learn in those 40 years to be prepared for the next 40 years. There was 40 years that he was in Pharaoh's court for some reason to understand that. Then there's 40 years he's on his own out there in the wilderness. He takes a wife. And then there's going to be 40 years that he's going to be spending leading Israel to their place. And he's got to be ready for it. And if you don't know that God is and that God is always for you, and that God does not change, and that God's mind on things is above and eternal, and, uh, and also present, eternally present, uh, then, you know, uh, it, there's going to be, how does he survive those 40 years? This process of preparation is a big one, and it's something that, you know, maybe we don't think about so much. What is God doing in my life? Why is he putting me in the places that I'm at? That I'm at? You know, why am I there? Why is it taking so long for this to change? Why is it taking so long? Why is that? You don't know. You don't know, what you, when, you don't know when the bush is going to be burning in your life and you have to take your shoes off somewhere. And it may happen in the most unlikeliest of places. You know, so that's just a lesson for us from Moses. Okay, he grew in confidence, though, towards God. As he leads this, at a certain point in Exodus 33, he asked God, he said, I would like to, you know, I've heard you, I've heard you, I've come up on the mountain, I've been in your presence, but I really haven't seen you, and I would like to see you. And so, from the burning bush to this place, um, you know, Moses grows in his relationship to God himself. And, uh, you know, at a certain, in Exodus 33, he says, I would like to see your glory, I would like to see I would like to see it all. Is there any way that I could see it all? And God says, that's not possible. You can't see it all, because my son hasn't died yet, because no man can see me in this way and live. But I'll do this. Stand on the rock. I'll put, as I go by, and this is all like figurative language. It says that God said, I'll put my hand over you. Somehow God shielded him from the glory as he went by, and then Moses could see the entrail. Like when you look up in the sky and you see like these, uh, you know, signs of where a jet went by, the entrail, that's what, that's what it says, his hind parts. It doesn't really mean that Moses saw God's butt. That's not what it means. It meant that, that, that Moses saw the afterglow 
or the entrail, like God's glory went by and however God shrouded it so that Moses could experience it and recognize it uh, in his humanity, uh, then that happened. So let me behold your glory. Moses could feel like that, you know, and that's, that's great confidence. Like, look at what you've done in my life. Look at what you've done in my life. Now I'm like ready to say, and you know, and then we get all the way to the book of Hebrews and we hear, hear the writer of Hebrews telling us to come boldly before the throne of grace. And so the sacrifice of Jesus makes it possible for us to come into his presence, you know, into his presence. We know the story of the tabernacle. When the glory of God fell on the tabernacle, even Moses wasn't allowed to go in there. So now, because of the sacrifice of Christ, we have the ability to say, show me your glory. And we can also say, I belong in your glory. Or you could say this, your glory is in me because of the sacrifice of Christ and the resurrection and our life in Christ, the spirit in us. All right. So those are the lessons from Moses' life. Now, he's going to tell these stories in Deuteronomy in three sort of sections. First, he's going to tell the people, okay, now you know why we were out here for 40 years. Let's go back. Let's talk about it a little bit. Let's, let's, you know, before we go on and before I teach you God's laws all over again, before you rehear them, rehearsal, rehear, you got to rehear something again before you re-rehearse it again. Let's, uh, let's, let's talk about why we're in this situation and why it took us 40 years to get there. So the first four chapters are that. He details the wanderings of Israel, minute details talking about just how much Israel spun around there. Then the rehearsal of God's laws for 21 chapter, 22 chapters, and then the promise of the future, the revelation of the future for Israel concludes the book. So... You know, the past, this is for your present, and, uh, and Moses gives some prophecies concerning what will happen in the future, and then, but this is the way it's all going to finish up for you. And so, Israel, if, if there's one book that we could understand um, the progression of what God is going to do with Israel, this is the book. It tells us, it gives us a great understanding of what's to come, and it shows us there. So, it will repeat things already said, so... Deuteronomy will repeat things Moses has already said. New tone, new emphasis, new atmosphere. You people are ready for something. God is ready to give you what he promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is, this is what I've been telling you ever since I started writing things down and speaking things about the book of Genesis. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are your fathers, and this is what they were promised, this piece of territory. Uh, shorefront territory, that's what it is, because their territory goes all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. This is what God has given you, this piece of land about the size of New Jersey. I know Pastor Shallow likes to say the size of Delaware, it's a little bit larger than that. I mean, it's supposed to be. When you see what it's really supposed to look like, but it is, it's a little bit larger than Delaware, maybe the size of New Jersey, but not much bigger than that. But it, this is the most contested piece of territory on the planet. So. All right, let's see. So these, these things happen in this book. Okay, so there you see uh, the first part is the reviewing of the wandering. That's the, that's the beginning of this. Um, we can see this is where they start out. Is it coming? Oh, sorry. There you go. This is where they start out. This is the land of Goshen up here. And you could see uh, just how much Pharaoh thought of Joseph and his people. Because I think uh, the capital city was more down here. This is Memphis or Noth. This is one of them. There was another capital city down here. But this is the Delta, the Delta territory of the Nile River. Now the Nile River flows what direction? South to north. Flows this way from Victoria Falls down in Uganda and uh, Zambia, that area, uh, Victoria Falls, that's the headwaters of the Nile and it flows this way up to here. And uh, this territory was like prime territory. And this is where Joseph came from this territory in Canaan over here and he come, came over to settle in, in this territory because there was a famine in the land over here. So this, this direct route 
right here is about 220 miles. So if they had just gone out from here, just started marching here, they would have come right up against the Philistines. Large people at that point, you know, because we know Goliath. They had large people there, you know. Large people built like NFL linemen, that kind of thing. Football kind of players. Large people, you know, um, Goliath was, you know, over seven feet tall, probably, maybe eight feet tall. And uh, how that happened, the, you know, there were descendants of Anak over here. And they, so these Philistines are warrior kind of people. And God said, I'm not going to bring them right into war. That's all this, you know, these people have been enslaved for 430 years. They're not going to know much about war. If I bring them right into war, they're going to run right back here, you know. So God's leading them down here through the Red Sea, and then, you know, they don't know a whole lot. They don't know that they could have circled right back in there and gone in there. <laughs> Some of them might have. But, you know, you know, you're leading a confused flock of people who have been under servitude and kept, you know, uh, dumb and, uh, and tired for 430 years. So, don't, you know, you got to cut this group of people some slack and say, you know, why didn't they just like figure it out? They didn't have Google Maps. You know, they didn't have any of that that they could have, or, or whatever, whatever, or Google Earth, so they could see the topography of the land. So they went down to this way. Now this, you know, God led them down here to Mount Sinai where he spoke to, spoke to Moses, gave the Ten Commandments. Now this, this kind of trail down here, and then they would come up here and eventually come into the Promised Land this way, crossing the Jordan River into this, you know, into this territory through this area. This is the Dead Sea here, and they would come across the Jordan River and go in up north of the Dead Sea. And the Jordan River goes up farther to the Sea of Galilee. But this is where they would come to when you see Jericho and Gilgal. That would be the center of their lives. And AI, this would be the first territory that they enter in and conquer there. But this territory going this way through the Red Sea, the swallowing up of the Egyptians, this is only 600 miles. I know, but you know, you think about it, uh, traveling, um, let's be, let's say they traveled a 5K a day, five kilometers, 6.2 miles a day. They should have arrived here in about 590 or, I mean, uh, 100, you know, 90 to 100 days. I mean, this way, it should have only taken them about 11 days traveling this way along one of the better highways. This was like a, uh, a coastal highway around here, well-traveled um, uh, trade thoroughfare, uh, because this is where Joseph was living here. He was sold to traders who went down this highway and sold him into Egypt. So this is only 600 miles for them to get here. If they have gone six miles a day, even though it's a couple million people, they probably could have done it. Or they could have sent, you know, they sent some soldiers up to spy out the land from here and then came back down to Kadesh Barnea. That's where they had their um, trouble. That's when they refused to go in and take the territory. You know, so, they're, so that's the, um, their territory started like right around here and they refused to go in and, and exercise their authority to get it all. So 600 miles, it should have taken them just about 100 days to get there. But it took them 40 years. 40 years of mostly, it's mostly this place where they were wandering. After they get to this point and send in the spies and the spies come back, then mostly they spend most of their time wandering in this like circle right around here. Seeing this again and again and again and again and again, you know, and that's, that's the way it went for 40 years. The cloud goes up, they move, they have a few rebellions, that kind of thing. They have a problem with snakes. Uh, they have a problem with uh, plagues and things like that. Thousands of people die here. Thousands of people die there. It happens. And now, now they are come to this point. This is where this happens. This is Mount... Oh, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Back. This is Mount Nebo right here. And that is where... Uh, Moses will be able to look across and see the land. God will give Moses a vision of the land, but he will not be allowed to go in to the land. And uh, we'll talk about that in the next part of class. All right, so at 7 o'clock you can take a 10-minute break, and we'll come back and uh, transition into the next part of Deuteronomy here.
Okay? You good? All right. Glad. Happy.